the John Lewis Partnership, a name synonymous with excellent value, customer service, integrity and vision. Many are unaware that this modern stalwart of British retail has a near revolutionary history, defying two world wars, the Great Depression, political upheavals and countless economic recessions. Its legacy is attributed to one man and his lifelong experiment for social justice and business ingenuity. John Speedon Lewis was born in 1885, the son of John Lewis Sr., a draper who owned a small shop on Oxford Street. At 19, Speedon entered his father's business and at 21 was given a quarter share, valued at £50,000, of the Oxford Street shop. In 1905, Speedon Lewis had been in the business probably less than a year but he had already formed some very good ideas about what working in business was going to involve. The property of Peter Jones came on the market. Mr John Lewis took 21,000 pound notes and walked down from Oxford Street to Peter Jones and purchased the shop. This acquisition would prove to be monumental for Speed and Lewis. Retailing was very different in those days and his father had been running his business for a long time. He hadn't been doing it as efficiently as he could have been. The staff were being paid a pittance for what they were working and Speedon realised this was really very unfair. They were getting hardly more than a bare living. It was soon clear to me that my father's success had been due to his trying constantly to give very good value to people who wished to exchange their money for his merchandise. But it also became clear to me that the business would have grown further if he had done the same for those who wished to exchange their work for his money. In 1909, Speedon was thrown from his horse whilst riding into work. He spent two years convalescing, a crucial period of time for both Speedon and the family business, as it was here that he dreamt up the idea for the partnership. He was absolutely obsessed with fairness, and he really wanted the people that worked for him to share the profits of the business. What really made him think that was there was him, his father and his brother, and they were taking something like £26,000 a year at the business. He had 300 employees and they were only taking £16,000. So he, he thought for a long time that perhaps the way was to go for a limited liability company because by doing that, they could share the risk, he could put capital into the business and it could grow. Speedon's thoughts for a third way were not overtly philanthropic, merely that he believed in fairness and humanity. So he decided to set up what were known as the Committees for Communication. Now these committees were made up of members of each department who could then report to him on what was going on in their department, what they thought could be improved and any problems they were having. It was really the first manifestation of his ideas of partnership. In 1914, with the outbreak of war looming and Peter Jones making a loss, Speed and convinced his father that he should become managing director of Peter Jones. The following year of 1915, with the Committee for Communication only serving to hear the voices of the shop floor staff, Speed and created the council, a democratic move to include the buyers and managers, a key element of a partnership for all. In 1916, Speed and withdrew from active participation in the John Lewis shop and exchanged his quarter share for his father's controlling holding in Peter Jones. With his father supposedly out of the picture, Speedon could begin to push his plans for the partnership even further and start to implement the third way. He wanted it to be the case that those who were doing the work by forming together as a cooperative could actually then be in a position to go out and get the necessary capital to grow their business rather than that the people with the capital could simply go out and hire and fire the labour they needed. He probably would have been seen as somebody that was very, very radical. And I suppose perhaps threatening as well to the establishment and threatening to the received way that you did business. Now Sweden had a free reign at Peter Jones. Not only did he increase wages and their conditions of service, but also, something quite unusual in the retail trade at that time, gave them all an extra week's holiday. Three weeks holiday in 1916 was something unheard of. By 1920, with the war now behind them, Peter Jones was finally turning a profit. In that year, the first distribution of partnership benefit was made of a bonus of seven weeks pay, a triumph for both the workers and their managing director. But by Christmas of that year, the euphoria at Peter Jones had dwindled, as a national slump meant profits disappeared and dividends were unpaid for four years. 
Things eventually turned around for Peter Jones in 1925, and profit sharing was resumed. The following year, with his father now 90, Speedon now became the effective owner-manager of both stores. With business doing well, Speedon immediately began the introduction of the partnership at Oxford Street. The economy has, has picked up. It was at that time, never knowingly undersold came out as a slogan, and that's still the backbone of our business today. The first advert came out in the late 20s, saying it was the best value in London and the most obliging staff. So he was really pushing the brand. He was getting really serious about how he wanted this company to be run. I mean, he actually drew up a 268-page constitution. That's really revolutionary again. Perhaps today we call command and control, but there it is written down so partners or anybody can actually see that's the way the company is to be run. It was at that stage as well he also uh, broke other moulds by making it into a public company. So he formed John Lewis Partnership Limited, which was a very different kind of company, and he made what was called an irrevocable trust settlement. So that, that couldn't be changed, and, and he set up a trust settlement where there were five trustees, himself the deputy chairman, and three trustees elected, and they were partners, and that really formed the backbone, and, and it's a similar structure we have today in the company. The 1930s were a boom time for John Lewis' partnership, as expansion began to grow beyond the boundaries of London. In 1937, Waitrose Limited, a prosperous grocery business started in 1904 by Wallace Waite, Arthur Rose and David Taylor, was bought by the partnership. Wallace, the dynamic force behind the business, decided to cement the company's future by looking for someone to continue his work after his retirement. The partnership acquired the 10 Waitrose branches. The 164 employees became partners, and the annual turnover of £150,000 swelled the money available for partnership bonus. In 1940, despite the problems caused by the Second World War, Speedon took on an amazing opportunity. He was able to pick up 15 department stores from the Selfridge Provincial Group. It was really fortuitous that he bought the group. In September 1940, an oil bomb dropped on the main shop in Oxford Street and it was completely destroyed. After the war, Waitrose acquired several small chains of grocery businesses, including Schofield and Martin and Bees and Teas. In 1950, at the end of an incredible decade of growth for the business, Speedon signed away to the partnership the last vestiges of his power. Now in 1950, he did something that was even more revolutionary. It was an irrevocable uh, signing of the second trust settlement. And that actually signed the company over in its entirety to the people that worked for it. But this was a real sign that now he was saying to partners, this is all yours. The 1950s saw further change to how retail served the customer. Self-service was introduced in Waitrose. First tried in the US, Schofield and Martin's shop in South End became the first partnership shop to take out the old counters and replace them with a turnstile entrance. And new fixtures with signs telling the customers how to serve themselves. In 1955, with Speedon reaching his 70th birthday, he retired after 50 years of service to the company and its partners. Bernard Miller was the perfect successor to the role, as he had worked all his life alongside Speedon. Miller oversaw the rebuild of the Oxford Street branch, which continued to trade throughout the building works. The first Waitrose supermarket opened in Streatham. At 2,500 square feet of selling space, it was by far the largest food shop in the partnership. On the 21st of February 1963, John Speedon Lewis died at the age of 77. His legacy was the creation of a unique business, powered by its partners, and a new way of working. Speedon was an incredible man, and he was always going to be challenging for the person that followed him. One of the strengths of our business is, if you look at the chief executives today, there have been six since 1864. Now, that enables whoever sits in that arena to take a much longer-term view about how we run our business. The average tenure for a CEO nowadays is six years but we're looking at six since 1864. And it's that willingness to take a long-term view, not to be dictated by short-term stock market price that has made a real business thrive. And that, to me, is one of the key differences between us and something that's run through Share Capital as a PLC. The partnership continued to acquire estates and retreats for the use of its partners and its charities, 
and throughout the 1990s, Chairman Sir Stuart Hampson introduced multi-channel retail. He really understood the potential for Waitrose. The division was at the forefront of the move towards supplying organic produce. Happily for the John Lewis partnership, the wishes of its founder are still carried out today. The partnership continues to be a flexible, resilient and ambitious retailing force in the UK, yet keeps its partners at the heart of a democratic business. Despite the financial crash of 2008, John Lewis continued to lead the market with bold expansions in Leicester, Cardiff and Stratford, while Waitrose reached out all over the UK. Expansion and development of multi-channel and online operations has been a key area of success, supported by the new distribution operations at Magna Park and Bracknell. Waitrose introduced smaller format shops alongside new partnerships and branches abroad. And the new John Lewis at Home format has been delivered to retail parks in record-breaking time, bringing John Lewis's never-knowingly undersold promise to ever more customers. John Speed and Lewis's greatest monument lies in the successful business the partnership has become, while adhering to and extending the democratic system which he created. The John Lewis partnership is the envy of employees all over the world, and the pride of its partners, who still share in the responsibilities and rewards of co-ownership. The partnership has always changed with the times. And that's because the retail landscape is constantly moving and that's being accelerated by technology which is changing the way we shop and the way we work. We've been growing in a number of ways through new shops and refurbishments, new formats and increased online presence and innovative product ranges. We're also continuing to invest in our omni-channel services in order to provide greater choice and flexibility. And the partnership will keep moving in line with changing trends and demands to ensure that we're best placed to meet the expectations of our customers. There's an exciting future ahead.